Okay, welcome back. Uh, so the next talk is by Pritish Kamath. Pritish is a postdoc at TTI Chicago. Before that, he was a graduate student at MIT, a research fellow at Microsoft Research Bangalore, and a student here at IIT Bombay. And he has worked in a number of areas in complexity theory, including uh, algebraic complexity, communication complexity, proof complexity, and so on. And now he's trying to use these skills to uncover the mysteries of machine learning. <laughs> and uh, today, Today, he'll tell us about uh, how to use lifting theorems to prove monotone circuit load bonds. Great. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and like thanks for inviting me here. I mean, it's really special to be back in IIT Bombay. And uh, yeah, so I'll start with the talk. And this is joint work with actually Ankit and Mika, Robert, and Dimitri. So, uh, like when I was like close to graduating from undergrad, I started to get fascinated by this like holy grail of complexity, which which we, that we want to understand what makes problems computationally hard. So we want hardness results for explicit functions. Uh, so and, and this is really fascinating and maybe intimidating because somehow you have to rule out all possible non-trivial algorithmic paradigms. So how, how would you be able to do this? So I think complexity theorists tried to like move early on to studying the circuit model where you just have very simple operations and or and not gates and uh, we just care about the number of gates, number of operations involved. And since any algorithm can be simulated by a circuit with whose size is roughly the same as the running time, it suffices to prove like lower bounds on circuits, right? And I mean, it, circuits don't seem to be the right programming abstraction. Like you wouldn't write a program in this way, even though, I mean, <laughs> I must say that it's like we are in living in this strange time where uh, a lot of these ML tasks are being solved by neural networks, which are circuit-like, and it's, it's really very spectacular time to be in. <laughs> um, so anyway, this psychological trick of looking at circuits with the hope that lo proving lower bounds will be easier, that psychological trick has not played out very well, and I mean, we barely know linear lower bounds. So, so, so I think I mean, people turn to uh, studying restricted models of circuits, so one such restriction, which was like very popular in the 80s, was this monotone model of computation, where you don't have any not gates. So you just have AND and OR gates. So this model is already restricted in that uh, it can only compute monotone functions. So a function is monotone if, if x is bitwise less than y, then f of x is less than or equal to f of y. Right? So uh, like with AND and OR gates, you can only compute monotone functions. So people asked, OK, can we at least prove lower bounds for these restricted model of circuits? Uh, and uh, Rasborough, uh, and followed by uh, work by Alon, Nogalon, and Ravi Bopanna, showed that the clique function requires exponential size monotone circuits. Okay, so, and clique, clique is this NP hard function. So, like, there was a lot of excitement. And, uh, like, my advisor told me this story actually that uh, at that time, Mike Sipser made a bet that P versus NP is going to be resolved in the next few years because all you need to do is reason about not gates and you know, how hard can that be? Uh, but uh, shortly after, Rasborov showed a super polynomial lower bound for uh, monotone circuit lower bound for the problem of perfect matching. So, so which shows that, okay, monotone circuits are not that powerful because matching can be solved in polynomial time. And this was further even extended by Tardosh to sh exhibit a function which requires, which can be solved in polynomial time, but requires exponential sized monotone circuits. So it's a really strong separation. Right? So, so, so then, I mean, the excitement dampened a little bit and Mike Sipser lost his bet. Um, but I mean, you can ask, okay, are monotone circuit lower bounds interesting today? And I want to argue that it is still interesting today because, I mean, there are many reasons, so many connections. So, I mean, this workshop is about communication complexity and having elegant mathematical connections is probably reason enough to study something. But there are also applications to proof complexity that we'll talk about, connecting monotone complexity to proof complexity. There's also this very cute connection. I don't know if it will be talked about in the following talks. But there's a nice connection between monotone complexity and uh, extension complexity, which inspired this lower bound by Mika, Rahul, uh, Rahul Jain, and Tom Watson uh, on extended formulations of independent state. I, I don't want to talk about it too much, but I don't know if it will come up uh, in the next talks. And there's also 
this interesting connection, not with monotone circuits, but with monotone span programs, which carry, which capture linear secret sharing schemes in cryptography. So, so there are a lot of interesting things happening, uh, and why monotone circuit lower bounds are interesting. Okay, so bringing us to the theme of this workshop, right? We want to understand lifting theorems. So, what are these? So, here we have we take a weak model of computation and a strong model of computation. Uh, and the goal is to say that if this weak model cannot do some task x, then the strong model also cannot do a related task to x. Right? That's the we want to show this in a black box way. Okay? And the weak model in this talk will be resolution refutations, which Mark I mean, already set the stage for. And and the strong model will be monotone circuits. Okay? So previously there's all there is this work on feasible interpolation, which takes lower bounds on monotone circuits and uses it to prove lower bounds on resolution. So that can be seen as the easier side, right? And the goal of a lifting theorem is to do the converse, which is take lower bounds on resolution and prove lower bounds on monotone circuits. So let me quickly flash this theorem, but I'll come back to it again in more detail. But what this theorem does is you give me any uh, unsatisfiable K C N F on n variables, and which for which you have a resolution width lower bound. I'll define this uh, in this talk, but, uh, but you give me any such lower bound, and there exists a very related function f on like n to the k many variables, for which you get a monotone circuit lower bound. Okay, so that's I'll get back to this theorem again uh, later. Okay, uh, but before that, I want to also say that like this lower bound, this lifting theorem can also be strengthened to this much stronger model of monotone real circuits. Actually, this corresponds to what Mark uh, called as communication with the greater than oracle. And that will be clear, uh, hopefully, in my talk. Uh, so, so this monotone real circuit model is this model where you allow the wires to carry arbitrary real values. Okay, The inputs are Boolean, outputs are Boolean. But the wires can be arbitrary real values. And any gate, so you have allow only gates of arity 2. And they can compute an arbitrary monotone function over two real inputs. Okay, so it's a much stronger model of uh, of circuits. So, just as a funny aside, just want an example. Monotone real circuits can simulate all monotone neural networks, like neural networks where all weights are non-negative and all activations are monotone, which is true of the popular ones. Okay, so just to give an example, so. Right. So, and but the reason in complexity theory why monotone real circuits were introduced was because proving lower bounds there imply lower bounds on these cutting plane refutations. Okay. So I'll I'll get to all of these definitions in the talk, but just want to give you a high level picture first. Okay. So just to motivate you bef before I like, get into the details, I want to give you a, a very crisp corollary that comes out of this lifting theorem, which is this lower bound on on this XOR SAT function and, and like the punchline is that monotone circuits cannot perform Gaussian elimination over F2. Okay, so what is this function? So, so normally in 3 XOR SAT, you have a, a system of 3 XOR constraints, and you want to know whether it is satisfiable or not. Here, I'll write the input slightly differently, which is first I write down all 3 XOR constraints. Okay, these are roughly 2n cubed, many of them. And I'll treat my input as an indicator vector of which constraints are in my system. This is an equivalent representation of the same problem. Right? And, and I'll say that the function is 1 if the system encoded by this indicator vector is unsatisfiable. So, so unsatisfiable because I want the function to be monotone. So think about it. So it's, if I flip a 0 to a 1, it means I'm adding a constraint to the system. So it can only be more unsatisfiable. right? So, so this function now you agree is monotone, right? And for this function, uh, we can this lifting theorem machinery implies that it's monotone. Even real monotone circuit lower bounds is is exponential, like two to the n to the epsilon. Okay, is it clear? So, I mean, the the context of this is that okay, if you look at the monotone versus non-monotone separations I mentioned before, so there was one for matching which is in randomized NC2, and but the lower bound is only super polynomial. And there was Stardosh's function, which was in P, but it requires you to solve a semi-definite program, so maybe it's not in NC. 
but this XR sat is a, it's a very easy function, right? It's just Gaussian elimination. It can be reduced. It can be solved in NC2. It can be reduced to determinants. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a monotone circuit lower bound for a very easy function, okay? So one thing that's interesting also is that all previous lower bounds used this like really uh, fantastic like technique due to Rasborough called this method of approximations. Uh, whereas the lower bound that I'm going to show you is going to follow from a communication complexity approach by, uh, by a lifting theorem. So it's a very different approach to proving lower bounds. Okay, so back to this picture. Okay, so I want to take lower bounds on resolution and prove lower bounds on monotone circuits. But really what's underlying this lifting theorem is really query complexity and communication complexity. And there is already Mark alluded to this connection between query complexity and resolution. There is also a very nice connection between communication and monotone circuits, which I'll tell you about, right? And the lifting theorem is really in this language of query and communication. So let's start with start with communication complexity, okay? So it has been already introduced many times, so just introduced by a picture. So, uh, so Arkadev mentioned that you, know, you can study decision problems, promise problems, or search problems. But in this talk, I'm only going to talk about search problems, right? So in search problems, you're given Alice is given X, Bob is given Y, and there are many possible answers that could be valid for X and Y. And your, your goal is to communicate the, and find at least one valid answer to X, Y. Right, okay? So I'll give you an example of, of such a communication task. But before that, communication protocols can be like conveniently represented as trees, where you have Alice nodes and Bob nodes, right? I suppose everybody is familiar with that by now. Okay, so, so bringing the connection to monotone circuits and communication complexity was done in this really beautiful, elegant work of Karshmer and Wigderson in the late 80s. So what they said was, okay, you give me a monotone function. Okay, if you, how many people have seen this connection, actually? Okay, hopefully some people have not. Okay, so let me go over this. It's really elegant. Okay, so, so you give me a monotone function f. From it, you construct a communication search problem where you say that, okay, I give Alice an input uh, it's uh, Alice a one input of f, right? And, uh, x such that f of x is one. Give Bob a y such that f of y is zero. Clearly, x and y are different, and since f is monotone, there must exist a coordinate where x i is one and y i is zero. Okay. If not, then the function wouldn't be monotone. So for any x and y like this, there must exist such a coordinate. So the goal is to find this coordinate. So it's a search problem. Uh, and the easy direction of this is, is like very elegant, uh, very instructive. So you can come up, given a formula for f, I can come up with a protocol for solving this search problem, which is that I start at the top gate. I know that it evaluates to one for Alice and zero for Bob, which means that if it's an OR gate, right, at least one of its wires must be one for Alice, but both the wires should be zero for Bob. So Alice can communicate which one that is, and you can go down this uh, formula, and you can keep going down, and finally at the leaf you will have a solution, right? Uh, and in, like this direction also works in the converse, so you get this exact like exact equality, which is that the communication complexity of this monotone kashmir wigderson game is exactly equal to the monotone circuit depth of f. Okay, there's also a non-monotone version of this, but I, I won't talk about it. But it, it let me be upfront about that. So there is a non-monotone search problem, and it captures non-monotone circuit depth. Okay. So, but really, this connection is not about circuits. It's really about formulas because formulas can be balanced. So, circuit depth. If I have circuit depth d, I can open it up to a formula of size two to the d. So, it's really capturing log of the formula size, log of the monotone formula size. So, this connection is between communication complexity and monotone formulas. So going back to this picture, I told you about this connection between communication complexity and formulas. So now let me tell you about query complexity and resolution, which Mark already talked about. Uh, so in query complexity, you have, a, again, I'm going to only talk about search problems. So uh, for any input, any binary, n-bit input, you have, you, your goal is to query bits and come up with a valid answer for that input. Okay, so the connection to, Mark already talked about resolution. So here you have an unsatisfiable CNF. Okay, here's an unsatisfiable CNF. 
And, and why is it unsatisfiable? Okay, here's a resolution proof. So this mark already described before. So you resolve on Z1, you resolve on Z2, and come up with a contradiction. Uh, and, and the connection to query complexity is that you can just turn this upside down. And so for any unsatisfiable CNF, you can define a search problem, right, which is that given any input Z, right, since it's unsatisfiable, there must be at least one clause which that assignment violates, and the goal search problem, goal of the search problem is to find that clause. Okay, and the connection to query complexity is just that you turn this resolution proof upside down. It's really proof by picture. But decision, rep, decision tree depth for this search problem is exactly the resolution depth needed to refute this unsatisfiable CSP, okay? So, so that co completes this connection between query complexity and resolution. So finally, I want to tell you about this lifting theorem. So this was already Arkadev talked about. So, so just for, for deterministic decision trees, so there's this lifting theorem from, for, from Raz McKenzie, but also like there are these many, many dots, uh, many, many works which have changed the gadget and so on. Like Arkadev's talk was about using different gadgets, but I'll stick to the Raz McKenzie version uh, because that's closer to what we do. Um, so it says that you start with a query search problem and you compose, you, you replace each bit by a communication gadget on two inputs, give all the access to Alice, all the Y's to Bob. And now the communication complexity of this composed search problem is lower bounded by, or it's essentially the decision tree complexity times log M, where M is the communication cost of the gadget. So I'll, in Raz McKenzie, they use a specific gadget, which is this indexing gadget, where Alice has a pointer in one to M, and Bob has M bits, and the, the goal is to compute the X bit of Y. And that's the indexing, and like indexing is sort of complete for proving lifting theorem. So any lifting theorem we prove, you could also prove it with the indexing gadget. Okay, so, so this is, and this is what Raz McKenzie showed, and I'll stick to this, even though there are lifting theorems with improved, uh, like smaller gadget size, okay? So, so that proves this direction of the lifting theorem. So if you put all this together, like this was the result in Raz and McKenzie, which is to prove that monotone NCI plus one is not contained in monotone NCI. So a depth separation for monotone formulas. Okay, that was that was their motivation. And if you put it, if you apply this machine, if you start with like a particular query problem, you can actually recover a monotone formula lower bound for XOR sat, like this three XOR sat problem that I mentioned in the beginning. You can prove this exponential lower bound for monotone formulas for XR side, okay? So, so now what, what should we do if we want to go to circuits, right? And uh, like the challenge seems to be that like decision trees, communication protocols, formulas, they're all tree-like objects. Somehow you need to reason about like DAG-like objects, okay? That's what Mark already alluded to. So this is, uh, like as many things in complexity theory, this was already studied by Rasboro in the 90s. Uh, like this is really, I mean, it's, it's hidden in this paper and some, for some reason this is not taught, this connection is not taught in communication complexity courses. Uh, I don't know, somehow it was, it was missed. Or, I mean, it's, of course it existed in literature, but somehow it's not made it to mainstream courses. But uh, Rasboro's definition was slightly more complicated. Uh, so th it was simplified later by in, in the work of Dimitri Sokolov. Okay. So I'll present the simplified definition and later get back to what Rasborough actually did. So to define this notion of communication DAGs, okay, uh, let me start by going back to a definition of a tree-like communication, right? It's, and then I'll generalize it to DAG-like. So I'll define tree-like communication in a different way. So I have this tree-like protocol. So every node of this tree corresponds to a rectangle. Okay, so the root node corresponds to the x, y rectangle. And as you go for any node, it gets partitioned into its two children node. So, so for any node v, it is partitioned into two rectangles which correspond to its two children, right? And then as you go down the tree, keep getting partitioned and finally at the leaf, you are labeled by an answer, right? So, so that gives you a, a partition of a rectangle into these monochromatic rectangles, okay? Note that in this definition, like a, a very slick thing that happened here is that 
there was no explicit reference of Alice and Bob. Like there was no, I didn't talk about two parties. I just talked about rectangles being partitioned. And, and the reason, Alice and Bob is really implicit in this because a rectangle, if it's partitioned into two, it can only be split horizontally or vertically. And that corresponds to the Alice or Bob. Okay, so but in going to this definition, you, you got rid of an explicit mention of Alice and Bob. So to generalize this to DAG-like communication model, right? Uh, the only thing you need to do is really change this one line. That instead of a node getting partitioned into two rectangles, you replace it by saying that a node is covered by the two child rectangles. Okay, so in picture, like if, if this is a parent rectangle, if this no rectangle corresponds to the node V, I require that it is covered by its two child rectangles. That's the only change to get to this DAG-like communication model. And so the DAG communication complexity is just, is defined as the log of the number of nodes. So log, because that's what I did with formulas. I took log of the formula size. So it's log of the number of nodes. And the connection uh, of, like due to Rasborough and Dimitri's simplification is that this DAG communication complexity exactly captures log of the monotone circuit size. So going back to this picture, I told you about this equivalence between DAG communication and monotone circuits. Yeah. So uh, sorry, yeah, I just want to ask, uh, is it still true that uh, you can only cover it sort of row-wise or column? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, that's that's an excellent point. So in proving this equivalence, you have to, uh, like how do you prove the converse? You From going from a DAG communication protocol to uh, a circuit, you have to replace some things by AND and something by OR, and that's determined by a rectangle if it's covered by two, rectangles, it has to be covered either horizontally or vertically. So actually, if I can go back to this picture. So this is covered vertically. So this is like a bob node. So you'll replace it by AND gate. Right. That's an excellent point, actually. That's how this equivalence is proved. And it's really along the same lines as the kashmir wigderson equivalence for formulas. Okay. So now let me tell you about this query complexity, uh, uh, like the DAG query model. Uh, so going back to, again to decision trees, Right, I'll redefine decision trees in a different way. So you have a tree where every node is labeled by a subcube. Right, So the top node is labeled by the entire Boolean cube. And then as you go down the decision tree, the subcube gets partitioned into two subcubes. Right, And then you keep going down. And finally, at the leaf, you are labeled by uh, like an answer. Right, so this gives you a partition of the entire Boolean cube into sub monochromatic subcubes. Okay, and the decision tree complexity I can define it now as the maximum co-dimension of any subcube anywhere in this. Like it's just this is the same thing, but just a different way to say it. Right, the maximum number of bits that are fixed in any subcube anywhere in this tree. That's the decision tree complexity. So to define DAG decision DAGs. Uh, the only thing that you need to change is again this line, which is instead of subcubes being partitioned into two subcubes, they are now covered by two subcubes. So just to give an example, so this is, let's say, the subcube corresponding to V. So these four bits are fixed. Uh, uh, it is covered by these two, uh, these two subcubes. And the way to see it is that there is this red coordinate. It could either be 0 or 1. If it is 0, it is covered here. And if it's one, it is covered in the lower one. So if the top node is root, then the fact that you're at does it not mean that the width can be at most? I mean, width can be at most the depth, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. But width can be much smaller. So, right, I can, it can be smaller because I can forget things along the way and. Right. So actually, I'm, I'm going to clarify that point, but let me just say here that, so this DAG decision tree complexity of this search problem, this same search problem that Mark defined before. So for, uh, I give you an assignment, and your goal is to find a clause that is violated. Right. So the DAG query complexity of this search problem is captures this resolution width instead of resolution depth. Okay. Uh, so to clarify a little bit more on that point, there is an alternate way to think about query DAGs, which is maybe more nicer. So, so in decision trees, you think of it as a game between two players. So there's an explorer and an adversary. The explorer queries a coordinate, and the adversary replies back with what that coordinate is. So in decision trees, you only query. In decision DAGs, 
you can either query, so in any round, you can either choose a coordinate and get an answer for that coordinate, or you can forget, choose a coordinate and forget that, forget what that value was. But the interesting, the important detail here is that when you forget, if you ask that value again, there's no guarantee that uh, this, uh, the re value return will be the same. And you have to be robust to that. You have to be correct, even if the, uh, uh, if you forget something and the answer next time is different, you still have to be correct no matter what. So at the end, like when the game ends, you have only queried some, you only remember having queried some bits and that should be enough to give you an answer to the search problem. So I mean, yeah, it takes maybe some time to wrap your heads around this if you haven't seen this, but so really, I mean, there's nothing very deep going on. It's very simple, very nice connections here, okay? So I told you now about this, uh, this connection between DAG query model, decision DAGs, and resolution width, as opposed to resolution depth. Okay, so finally I want to tell you about this last piece, which is this lifting theorem. So that was the sort of goal of this talk. So what we can show is that, okay, if you start with a query search problem, compose it with the indexing gadget, and now the DAG communication complexity of this composed problem is lower bounded by the decision DAG complexity of the query search problem, right? And so it's really it's along the same lines as the ras mckenzie And we prove it again with the indexing gadget. Actually, it's an interesting question to prove it for other gadgets. So it's a question for Arkadev, okay? So since this is a workshop, I want to tell you a little bit about the proof. So, uh, so this paper, I really like this paper. It's called Rectangles and Non-Negative Juntas. It really laid down the foundation for this new generation of lifting theorems. Uh, and it introduced this notion of density, which was written here before, like this notion of blockwise density and so on. But let me not talk about those details, but just talk at a high level. So consider a rectangle in this space of all inputs, right? So I'm looking at the indexing gadget. So Alice has n pointers in one to n and Bob has n blocks of m bits each, so it's n copies of the indexing gadget. And we like a recta rectangle is good if when I apply the indexing gadget, it looks like this, that some number of bits are fixed and the other bits are have full support. So what that really means is that, intuitively it means that Alice and Bob have communicated information about D coordinates and they have not communicated anything about the other coordinates. Like that's, that's the rough intuition. So we like rectangles which are like this. Not all rectangles may be like this, but we like rectangles because it has a nice intuition that Alice and Bob are really simulating the, the query world. They are simulating the query comes. So they're only communicating blockwise and not doing some non-trivial communication which involves all of their inputs, okay? So we like rectangles like this. And, and the, so actually I must say that, so in this, in the first paper by Mika, Shahar, Raghu, Tom, and David, it was proved for the inner product gadget. And then later it was strengthened by Mika, Tony, and Tom to the indexing gadget. And somehow we still, we need to use the indexing version. So, so we are really looking at the indexing gadget, okay? So, so now the, uh, the statement is that, okay, not all rectangles might be nice, but all rectangles can be decomposed into rectangles that are nice, okay? Okay, not, okay, this is not entirely true. There may be some rectangles which are bad, Okay, not all, so I, I take a, take, give me any rectangle in the space of all inputs. It can be partitioned into smaller rectangles. So either they're good, which means they're nice in this sense that if you apply the indexing gadget, it, it has only, it reveals the values of some small number of bits and it's, it has full support on the remaining. Right? But there may be some rectangles which are bad for which there are no guarantees, but at least those rectangles are covered in a very small number of rows and columns. Okay, this is actually the property why we need to use indexing and I don't know how to do it with inner product because I don't know how to get this property. So for, for, for all the non-error rectangles, they are structured, they are nice with having fixed only up to D coordinates, right? So, so this D is same as this D. So, so you can choose any D you want and you can get a decomposition. Something more special that we use, which was maybe not needed in other works, uh, is that, in fact, what you can show is that you achieve this full support on a single row of this nice rectangle. So I said that a rectangle is nice if it has some coordinates fixed and f uh, full support on the other coordinates. In fact, you can get the full support on, on a single row. Like it's not, it follows from 
like the theorem of Mik uh, Mikatoni at all. So let's see, okay, this might get a little bit technical, so maybe I'll just flash some animation, okay, let's see. So, so what we want to prove this theorem, which is that the communication, the DAG communication complexity of the compose search problem is lower bounded by the decision DAG uh, uh, complexity of the query search problem. And the, the way you do it is with a simulation type theorem, which is that you give me a communication DAG for this compose search problem, and I'll extract from it a decision. Uh, so you give me a communication DAG, and I'll extract from it a query DAG, a decision DAG. Uh, but I told you about this alternate interpretation of decision DAGs, which is this explorer versus adversary game, where you query a bit and you forget a bit. So you start by partitioning all the rectangles into structured rectangles. Okay, and uh, the proof follows this outline that for any rectangle, I, I, I'll start with the root, go down the communication DAG and recreate a query DAG out of it. Okay, and the invariant is that I start, for any rectangle, I'll have a structured rectangle in which I'm in currently. Okay, so at the root, I'll just start with the full rectangle and the structured rectangle is the full rectangle. Uh, in going from one rectangle to its children, okay, this part is, uh, I mean, there's, it's not very non-trivial, but it has, I mean, some arguments, and I don't want to stress you out with those simple arguments. So I'll just flash a proof by animation, okay? I've, I've worked very hard on these animations. So, uh, so, okay, so just be prepared. I'll just flash this animation, okay? Okay, that's it. So, so I, I started at a node, and I want to go to one of the ch ch child nodes, and you do it without actually having queried uh, a lot of bits. So, if you're like, going back in this animation, I started out remembering having queried these four bits, and I'm at node V, and I go, I go through these steps, and now I have reached node W, and I've remembered, I've queried some bits and forgotten some bits, and I'm still remembering only order D bits. <laughs> yeah, it's actually not very complicated, but it's just hard to do it in a talk, okay? So, uh, but it's only like two pages. It's not very complicated. Yeah, so I move from this rectangle to a structured rectangle of the child rectangle, and then I, I forget what I had there previously. Yeah, I can explain it offline if you, if you really want to know. Uh, it's not uh, really worth going into at this point. Okay, so now you keep going down the decision diag. And finally, when you reach a leaf, you have a valid answer for your uh, search problem. So you can extract out a, a decision DAG from a communication DAG. Okay. So okay. So that that was a little bit technical. So okay. So I promise I won't have too many technical things from here on. Okay. So I told you about this lifting theorem, and the conclusion we get out of it is is this. Okay. So this is the theorem I had shown in the beginning. So so you give me any n variate like KCNF, unsatisfiable KCNF, for which you know a resolution width lower bound, okay, of W. From it, I will construct an explicit function F on n to the order K many variables, for which this lifting theorem implies a monotone circuit lower bound of, of size n to the W. So just to go back to this corollary, like if in this theorem was maybe too general, so if you start with this F being this so-called Chaitin contradiction, which is something for which we know a resolution with lower bound, uh, almost linear lower bound, you can, from it, you get this XOR sat lower bound. So this point is, uh, for an what is the best you get? Oh, good, good, actually, yeah. So the reason why this, like this uh, machinery for us stops at only two to the n to the epsilon and not two to the n is because we need indexing gadget of polynomial size. And that's an actually a very important open question, which is if this simulation could be done with constant sized gadget, then you would get an explicit function with two to the omega n lower bound. And right now, actually, we don't even know, even without lifting, we don't know monotone circuit lower bounds of two to the omega n. We know two to the n to the one third, I think. Yeah, actually, so in in these reductions, actually, even if you do it with any other gadget, I would, these reductions work by reducing that gadget to indexing and then 
performing this reduction. So maybe in some special cases you might be able to do a clever reduction, uh, but not in this generic way. So it, it, there might be something, but I'm not, I cannot make a general statement out of a small size gadget. Maybe in some special cases for a special, if you start with a special particular unsatisfiable CNF, maybe you could come up with a smarter reduction. But as soon as I guess you have some organic thing uh, right, that's true, I would say, yeah, yeah, right, because then it would reduce to indexing, which is subpolynomial size, right. So, right, and the other thing I had mentioned was uh, this extension to monotone real circuits, right, so the way we get to this is, so I told you about this decomposition theorem for rectangles, so you can decompose any rectangle into these nice rectangles with errors which are contained in a small number of rows and columns. To do this low, lower bound for monotone real circuits, you need to talk about these triangles instead of rectangles. So now you have these triangle communication tags where every node is, instead of being labeled by a rectangle, it's labeled by a triangle, and every node is covered by its two child triangles. That's the triangle communication tag is equivalent to monotone real circuits. So the key to proving this lower bound is, is that we need to decompose triangles into these structured rectangles, junta-like rectangles. Okay, so that's, so I won't go into the details of that, but just to flash it at a high level, that, that's what's going on. Yeah, yeah, okay, good, good. Actually, I think Mark also didn't clarify it. So triangle is something that is uh, like the ones of a greater than function, right? So something that looks like this. For some permutation of rows and columns, uh, it looks like this. So it's something that can be reduced to a single greater than call. Right, so this is the real communication model or equivalently a model with this oracle query to a greater than. Right, so it's clear that such a thing can be solved with a one single greater than query. And finally, I also said that there is this application to this cutting plane refutation. So, okay, I mean Mark already defined this, but let me quickly go over it. So cutting planes are these things where statements are linear threshold functions and you can encode your classes as linear threshold functions and you do keep on deriving new statements till you end in zero greater than one, okay? And if you put everything together, the theorem we get is that if you start with any, give me an unsatisfiable KCNF on n variables for which you know that resolution width is at least W, for which you know resolution width lower bound, from it I can construct an n to the slightly polynomially larger 2K CNF for which the cutting plane's length is n to the omega w. Right, so I can take lower bounds on resolution and take, lift it to lower bounds on cutting planes and actually this is semantic cutting plane. So even the derivation rules don't matter because this communication, this triangle communication diag model cannot distinguish between semantic and syntactic cutting planes. So never mind if you don't know what semantic cutting planes is, but uh, this lower bound is for the semantic cutting planes model. Okay, so in particular, Mark mentioned, talked about this separation between polynomial calculus and cutting planes. So the way, if you want to separate any proof system from cutting planes, all you need to do is separate it from resolution, right? If you exhibit a CSP that is easy for your proof system but hard for resolution, you apply this lifting theorem and it will still remain easy for your proof system but will be hard for cutting planes. Right? That's, that's how you recover that statement. So I want to, like lighten the mood a little bit and talk about like is there a, so we talked about this lifting theorem, like is there a broader context for this or is it really something that's very niche and on its own, okay? So I want to like talk about this bigger picture and it's, it's a, something that I'm uh, like very interested in, okay? So let's look at this two search problems that I mentioned. So in the query world, I talked about this search problem where you have this unsatisfiable CNF, you're given an assignment and your goal is to find a clause which is violated, okay? In the communication world, we had this Kasch monotone kashmir Vigderson search problem where Alice had a one input, Bob has a zero input, you want to find a coordinate where Alice has a one, Bob has a zero, okay? Uh, so the observation here is actually that both of these have small non-deterministic cost. So, so this search problem has non-deterministic query cost of k because I can just tell you, you can just query those k bits, I can tell you which k bits to query, if you query those, you will get a clause which is violated. So you can be convinced that this clause is valid. And in the communication world, I just need to 
non-deterministically guess log n bits to find this coordinate which, uh, or, or in other words, I can cover my entire rectangle with n uh, monochromatic rectangles. So that's, so log n is the non-deterministic communication cost. So both these search problems are total search problems that they always have an answer for any input and they have small non-deterministic cost, okay? So in fact, the observation so this uh, is that these such type of search problems are actually complete for total search problems with small non-deterministic cost. So you give me any query search problem uh, which has small non-deterministic cost, I can reduce it to a search problem which looks like this, where there is an unsatisfiable CSP and you want to find a violated class. And similarly in the communication world, any total search problem with small non-deterministic cost can be reduced to a monotone kashmir Vigderson prob search problem. Okay, so, so these are total search problems with small non-deterministic cost. And I don't know if it reminds you of something, but like it is, these, these things are studied in the Turing machine world. So I don't know if many people attended this workshop on algorithmic game theory. So in game theory, people like this class called PPAD, which contains these Nash equilibrium and other problems. So if you look at, in the Turing machine world, if you look at search problems, there are search problems which are solvable in polynomial time. And then there are search problems which can be verified in polynomial time. Uh, but if you look at these classes, there are these rogue problems, like such as Nash equilibrium uh, or factoring, where there is, uh, these are total search problems, and so Nash equilibrium always exists, but it, it's still hard to find them. So how do we characterize the complexity of such problems? And to to address, to sort of talk about these problems, Papa Dimitriou and, and friends, uh, they defined this class called TFNP, total search problems in NP, where the solution is always guaranteed to exist. Whereas for SAT, you cannot really guarantee that a satisfying assignment always exists. So, and to specifically talk about these problems, uh, they defined these classes, subclasses of TFNP, which correspond to some mathematical principle that ensures totality of uh, of that search problem. So, so PLS corresponds to this uh, principle that every DAG has a sink, and PPP corresponds to the pigeonhole principle, and PPA corresponds to this class that every graph with an odd degree vertex has another. Okay, and uh, like for example, Nash is complete for PPAD, which is the PPA but on directed graphs. So, uh, never mind if you haven't seen these classes before, but there's some real nice connection here which I want to stress upon. So, so you can take these Turing machine search problem classes. And so for any complexity class in the Turing machine world, you can study it in the query world and in the communication world. So this is like very classic, right? So going back to this paper of Babai, Frankel, and Simon, they studied this Turing machine complexity classes in the communication world. Uh, there is this recent survey of Mika, Tony, and Tom, which I highly encourage you to look at on this land, this la like latest developments on these different uh, communication classes. So these are all communication classes in the decision world, whereas here I'm talking about these total search problems in, in the communication world. Right? So you can do the same thing for these TFNP subclasses, okay? So if I go back to like this lower bound I told you about on monotone formulas, right, through this lifting theorem of Raz and McKenzie. This can be seen as a lifting theorem for the class FP, which is problems which are solvable in polynomial time. So it's a lifting theorem from the query version of FP to the communication version of FP. So now going to this DAG communication, which is, brings me to the question of what was the broader context, right, so this lifting theorem from decision DAGs to communication DAGs, right, this can be interpreted as a lifting theorem for this class called PLS, which embodies this principle that every DAG has a sink. And in fact, Rasborough, uh, when I told you that Rasborough did, uh, defined some communication analog which captured circuits, he defined it as PLS communication complexity. So he said that, okay, this is PLS communication complexity, a, a PLS communication complexity of the monotone cartner Reederson game is capture circuit size. That's what he did, and, and this rectangle DAG that I defined is just a canonical version of, of looking at these arbitrary PLS protocols, okay? Right, so this is this lifting theorem for PLS, this query uh, 
DAGs to communication DAGs. I want to throw in one more connection which Mark alluded to, which is this lifting theorem from null Stellens arts to span programs. So never mind if you haven't heard of what span programs are before. Uh, but so null Stellens arts is a proof system, uh, which which Mark talked about, and uh, span programs are this computational model which. Uh, it talks about taking linear span of, of a given vector, testing whether a span of given vectors contains a specific target vector. So never mind if you haven't seen that before, but so the lifting theorem shows that of like Tony and Robert Robert shows that if you give me a lower bound on null arts degree, you get a lower bound on span programs. So if you restrict to the case of F2, this can be actually seen as a query to communication lifting for this class PPA which is this principle that every graph with odd degree vertex has another, okay? So, so going back to this picture, I told you that FP is same as formulas and tree-like resolution. PLS is like circuits and DAG-like resolution or resolution width. And PPA is equivalent to F2 span programs and F2 null stellens arts degree. And I really like this picture for some reason because it's really begging for more connections to be made, right? You take a TFNP subclass, you can ask, what is its corresponding proof system or computational model? You can start with a proof system and ask what is its, if there is a corresponding TFNP subclass. You can start with a computational model and ask if there is a corresponding TFNP subclass, right? So there's like one obvious uh, missing piece which, which can be made progress on, which is like we, here I only talked about F2, whereas there is also an FP lifting theorem, lifting theorem for FP null stellens arts and FT, FP span programs. So, we, we came up with a definition of some new class PPAP, which is equivalent to this, which captures this null stellens arts and span programs over FP. But it turned out that actually this definition was already given by Papa Dimitriou in the same paper where he defined PPA. It's like hidden in one paragraph, which has been overlooked, I think, for the most part. Uh, and this actually motivated us to go off on a tangent and study this class in the Turing machine world and uh, like give it give a natural complete problem for it. And I think this class is very interesting. It has, it can, it seems to be the right class to capture some interesting problems. I can tell you about it offline. This is not related to lifting. Uh, okay, so so I think this picture is interesting that it really asks for more connections to be made and it unifies, it gives a unified view for uh, understanding these lifting theorems. Okay, so that's it, so I'll just conclude here. So this, this is the lifting theorems I talked about. This is the TFNP picture. So I'll end with some open questions. So one great open question is proving these lifting theorem with constant size gadgets, which Rampers had alluded to earlier. So that would imply a two to the omega n monotone circuit low bound. Mark alluded to this question of lifting for DAG models with other shapes. So the intersection of triangles, for example, that would, have implications for proof system, which is like uh, like where lines are clauses over linear threshold functions. Uh, so another thing which is not related to lifting, but something that I was very interested in, but then eventually I gave up on it, which is proving this exponential monotone circuit lower bound for perfect matching. So Rasborough proved it, proved a super polynomial lower bound, but somehow this lifting machinery doesn't seem to be, like it's somehow I'm not, I don't know how to embed a lifted problem into matching. Uh, and I mean, this seems, this somehow also resembles this, uh, what's going on in extension complexity where Roth, Rothfuss proved this exponential lower bound for matching, uh, for, uh, for linear programming extended formulations, but somehow it doesn't seem to fit into this lifting framework. So maybe something, some direct proof is needed for matching. Uh, and, and finally, like th there is this picture which is, begging for more connections to be made. Two questions about uh, the questions here. So uh, the, what's the best monotone circuit low bound we have? I mean, yeah, I think it's two to the n to the one third. It's one third. Yeah, it's uh, Raz and Haken. Okay, and that's not a lifting? That's not a lifting. It, it uses the method of approximations. I think it's maybe from the 90s, I'm not very sure. And this uh, perfect matching question, so in the monotone world, uh, it may be that even bipartite perfect matching is, doesn't have some exponential size. Sir. Yeah, yeah, right. I think so. For, so actually, in the formula world, monotone formulas, we know this lower bound due to Raz and Wigderson, which is also for bipartite perfect matching. So it's a two to the square root n, which is uh, n r n is the number of variables type lower bound. Yeah, so it's conceivable that it could be for bipartite. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Whereas for extension complexity, it cannot be for bipartite. So it's slightly different. Did that imply anything for perfect matching? Uh... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. So Mika has told me this at some point in the past, not for matching, but for clique, you could get some better lower bound if you could do it within the product. But I exactly forget what that uh, reduction is. So if you could get it. If you had a lifting theorem with inner product, you could choose a specific outer search problem for which you could get a clever reduction to click. But I forget what the exact detail is. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here.